Well, we're down a man tonight. Down a man. It's kind of a weird thing. Paul and I are both going through, I guess just because we're old maybe, I don't know, but we're both going through <laughs> all kinds of dental surgery, both of us. I had last Monday, I had two, I had, well, I had two teeth like literally taken out last October and December. You have to wait three months to get like the posts put in to get the fake ones like screwed onto them. And I had that last Monday and now Paul's had another one taken out. Oh, I mean, you know why he did it now. It's obvious. Why for him? He did it. Tournament starts tomorrow. You think that's a coincidence? Oh, oh. well, or you know, today, if you're listening on Thursday, yeah, if you're listening on Thursday, kind of like every I, year, I think with the, the rate of vasectomies goes up by like a million percent right before March Madness. You're right yes, about so that. Everybody can watch. Yeah, I just that's... can't. I'm not into it. I'm, I can't. I'm not. I just, I guess I'll have wow. it on because I, I work from home. So, you know, but uh, I just, I did a bracket, but. Oh, it hits a lot also, different when your team is in it. It uh, definitely takes the wind out of your sails. Yes. Um, and we have the IMS bracket that you started. Normally I do the IMS radio thing and I, did it but if you guys are listening anybody listening or watching go to maryland at 24 7 sports.com if you go to the main board there's the the sticky link there's only one sticky link join the ims bracket challenge um if you guys can join that one year subscription to the winner six months to second place and anybody can join that so just go do that and join in our fun i will join it before tomorrow I'll do it. That's right the biggest this. problem with Maryland. With Maryland not being in the dance is uh, you're not, you don't care, you're not motivated. So I end up posting the bracket con- contest on Wednesday afternoon. So we got to get them back to the tournament. So, I, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I was emotionally, I, I was out of it. I, I tried to stay in and I tried to post threads and on this, on our show, I tried to be positive. When they lost that Wisconsin game. I think it just was the final thing for me. And I was like, it's just not. And and the way they lost, because I feel like they unfairly lost that game. Not that they, they maybe wouldn't have won, but I really wish the game would have been called fairly. It was so. Which game was constant when they lost by 90? No, 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 no. The regular season game when they had five games okay. left and they had to kind of win them all, or at least like four. I thought, you were talking, I thought for a second that you were blaming the refs for that. Third all-time largest <laughs> losing margin in Big Ten tournament history. No, 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 no. He no, has no, lost no. it. Um, no. Yeah, that was. But I mean, that's the story of the whole season. It's so hard to pinpoint any one loss. Like, I mean, one in ten in in five point games, games decided by five points or less, would be hard to do if you were trying. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible. Yeah. As so now, we're talking about uh, about Wisconsin, here we got this from Scott Stanford. Go to from Wisconsin. So there you go. Yeah, Terps are out of it. But there is some kind of excitement. And, and there's a part of me that's coming around a little bit to the new <laughs> paradigm. because <laughs> Funny how that works when your team desperately needs to rebuild overnight that you suddenly favor this system. Well, it's not. I don't favor the system. Okay, not favor. There's, not favor, there's a but, part um, of me that likes the idea of almost a free agency because like – in major and professional sports, free agency is really fun. The Ravens just signed Derrick Henry. That's fun to think about. The Orioles signed Corbin Burns. That's awesome, right? So it's fun when that happens. Um, so in a way, college sports is becoming a professional sports. Not in a um, way. It just is. It, it Yeah, but without well, – I won't go into without it. Without the professional need, guidelines, yeah. They need structure. They need – the schools need to pay the players. They – Asking the fans to pay the players is so ridiculous. Uh, there's a million things wrong with it right now. Yeah. They need to structure it, formalize it like pro sports are. Um, and then if there are contracts and all these kind of things and, and there are guidelines set in place and rules that you have to follow, then the, the free agency season might be kind of might be kind of fun. Yeah, um, it's so and, arbitrary now and yeah, on level that like – well, it could be worse. Imagine being, I've said this before, imagine being a college coach at like Belmont or like LaSalle or somewhere Jeez, even man. lower level, like, uh, you know, 
NJIT or something just because Bill Myers there. Like, if you have any player who you do a good job scouting, developing, he is gone. You have no chance of keeping him. Like, at that point, what what is even the point of having the job, you know? Um, it, so it could be worse, I would, guess. Well, that's bad. I mean, team fans of teams like that have to be just so discouraged. Like, what are we even doing this for? Yeah. And then the other teams that have to be discouraged – Oregon State and Washington State, my God, man. Ah, oh, I feel so bad for them. It makes me so sad because I, I loved having eight competitive conferences. I loved it. I remember the Southwest Conference, okay? I remember that growing up. So, like, there literally were, like, eight when I started watching and fell in love with college sports. Yeah. And, like, it's very sad for me to watch this happen. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that's kind of sad is just the – I'm a person, I think a lot of people are like this, where you get emotionally invested with the players and you watch them grow from year one to year four. And, you know, if they leave early, that's for the pros. That's one thing that, but that's because they're yeah. so good. That's a different thing. And now it's just like recruiting classes come in, signing day is like, okay, how many of these guys are ever going to see the field and then not see the field and transfer? How many are going to play sparingly and transfer? Like, how many of them are going to be at Maryland for three or four years? A quarter? Well, the good news, Less? though, <laughs> the good side is it allows you, if you're in a spot like Maryland, to yes. rebuild quickly, right? That used to take a few years. Now, if you do it right, you should be able to do it in one year. Yes. That is very good news and very exciting. And there's so much stuff. If you're, if you're on, if you're a subscriber to Maryland at 247sports.com, Inside Maryland Sports, You'll see all that. There's so much happening every day right now. It's kind of crazy. Um, it's kind of crazy. And then um, outgoing and ingoing, right? So who's going to leave? And already only two have made it official so far, correct? Caleb yeah, Swanton only Roger. two have left. Bachelor, Noah Bachelor, and Caleb Swanton Roger. Those were both fully right. expected. You know, there's no now. Yeah. It's a matter of. How many more? Because you got to clear some more room. Honestly, you need four, I would say, minimum four new players. Um, so you have two spots open now. There we, you know, I've reported on the site that those won't be the last uh, of the outgoing transfers. There's more to come. And do you have a strong idea who they're going to be? I mean, I've seen the articles and I've seen the names, like, but I'll let you. Say what no, you I think you'll see. Um, I think you'll see at least one more bench player depart, and then there's a few guys who seemed like they might leave, and now seem like they're probably going to come back. But the, obviously, the big question is Julian Reese. You know that one's kind of gone back and forth. That's the million dollar question. No pun. No nil pun intended. Um, you know, can you get him back? He's He's kind of wavered a little bit. I think there's a lot of different factors that go into it. Obviously, it would be good for them to know soon uh, if he's coming back so they know how to build this offseason. So that's, you know, far and away the biggest question aside from who they're going to get, which, as like you said, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of news on the site for subscribers about a whole bunch of really promising transfer like every hour changing almost like yeah it's, it's i mean like i've said to you and paul before thank god for portal season because usually right about now if the team if the team you cover is not in the ncaa tournament i mean you're already starting that summer dr content drought so at least it gives us gives the fans something to be excited about and follow and you know have some hope for next year so it's going to be yeah it has there's been a lot of news and there's going to be a lot a lot more yeah and speaking of whether some big names are coming back it may be based on NIL and the players that may be coming in that may be based on the type of NIL Maryland can offer and so we have a very good guest very pertinent guest for this situation we've got Harry Geller he was the founder of Turtle NIL which is they just they focus basketball, right? That's strictly not, basketball for them. Strictly yeah. basketball. And so we're gonna ask him a lot of questions, NIL questions, which I know people have a lot of questions about that. I've got a bunch here. You guys keep throwing in your questions. Think about that. The the guy who heads 
Maryland basketball NIL is going to be here. So throw your questions in for that. We already are starting to get some questions. Let me throw some of these at you. Um, Del Boca Vista is asking, would Malik Mack immediately be a top guard, top guard target for Maryland, the same level as the Belmont guard, who is uh, uh, J- uh, Jacoby Gillespie, right? Yep. And then, um, or would he be second tier? So, Jeff? Um, I would think that Mack would probably be, be a little bit behind Gillespie. Maryland really likes Gillespie, as does everybody. You know, most people consider him one of the top guards in the portal right now. Uh, had a huge sophomore year at Belmont, two years remaining, which makes him a little more valuable. So Malik Mack had a great freshman year at Harvard, has not entered the portal yet. The Washington Post actually did a big feature story talking to him and his dad about the difficulty of the decision because, you know, it's it's already a difficult one. But when you're when you get that Harvard degree on the line, it gets a whole lot more complicated. Um so long story short, if he if he does enter, you know, I think they will probably be interested. There's maybe some other guys ahead of him, and I think Gillespie is near the top of that list. Yeah, and I've I've got some uh Paul's not with us, but at, at the end of the show, I've got a Maryland rank them. And so I have some stuff where you're gonna have to rank some stuff with all these guys in there. So that'll be in there. We got we got, we're killing a half hour before Harry gets here. We got a question that I can kind of go off on a little bit here. Uh, Michael Wheatley asks, hey, Jeffrey Lawrence, what's the best fit for Clemson to the big or the SEC? I actually was going to do a show. I actually prepared an entire presentation. I was going to do a little 20, 30-minute show on my predictions on how align, realignment was all going to shake out. And I have that. So maybe I'll just do that show. Um, but I think, think you didn't do that um, five years ago because the odds that you would have had UCLA and Oregon to the Big Ten were probably slim. I may have. <laughs> I may have. Because there's rumors that the pack might dissolve anyway as far back as then. Uh, uh, but the question is, what is the best fit Clemson for the big of the SEC? They're an SEC school, right? I mean, like the All only the complication is that they're in the same state as South Carolina, right? So there's going to be some angst there with South Carolina, but I mean, please. Come on. Yeah, but it would be funny. They're, it would be they're fun. not AAU, right? Like the whole thing, like they don't, they're not a state, a large flagship research, research university. I mean, but it is about football and at Big Ten would want to get in the South, but come on, that's an SEC school. Well, right? first and, and most important of anything, it would be funny to watch them just beat the crap out of South Carolina and just infuriate them year after year. <laughs> we as, had a weird robbery with South Carolina just because they'd been trying to recruit all, Maryland, all the DMs. No, just because their fans are some of the yes. most obnoxious of any mediocre, any fans of a mediocre program That's that everybody. I've ever witnessed. Um, but – other than that, yeah, they're SEC all the way, SEC football environment. It's down south. Academics are not quite regarded on that same level as right. the Big Ten schools. I have no idea if they're an if they're an AAU member or not. Probably not. They're not. They're not. So. Yeah, I don't no, think so. And so uh, the Big Ten would have to break Which, that requirement. They didn't break that for any. Did they break that for any of the? They did, they have, no, they're all AAU. Yeah. That's what I thought. And it was AAU when they got admitted, but they're no longer AAU. They're the only one that's not. Yeah, so so they'd have to be breaking that rule for Clemson. Everything about it feel, has, feels and has always felt like they're an SEC program just stuck yeah. in the ACC. And after we talk to Harry, maybe I'll just pop up my sheet that I did here and we can we can talk about it here on this episode. I don't know. But Harry is here with us, so let's add him in. There he is. Hey. Hey, Harry. How you doing, Harry? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear okay. you. Awesome. I actually yeah, got I think, it. Oh, I got to get rid of the comment here. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. Turtle NIL, baby. That's right. Yeah. The the founder of, of Turtle NIL. And you also are kind of the main force behind it as well, right, with a few other people? Yes, yeah, so correct. Yeah, there's a, a board of five and um, – Three of us are uh, in the operating arena of it, and um, you know, it's it's been a great experience so far. Harry, what um, what are your feelings about the how competitive Maryland basketball is right now in the NIL space? Obviously, everybody freaks out over that. You have to have money now to get players 
where where do you feel like you guys are in kind of the landscape? Well, I think you know we're getting our arms around really what's going on out in the marketplace, like everyone is, and um, I think the coming year we're going to be extremely competitive. We probably won't be in the the first tier of the blues who have unlimited money, but you know we're we're going to be right behind them and, you know, probably in the top 10% of the, you know, all the programs out there. If, you know, there's a player out there that, um, you know, commands a lot of money, um, you know, we're going to be right in it. I mean, we saw that with Derek Queen, you know, he is a remarkable kid and uh, he has a market value and he knew it and his, you know, his team behind him knew it. And, um, he really wanted to come to Maryland, but, you know, we, we had to be competitive with everyone else regarding that, or he wouldn't have come, and I don't blame him for that. We saw some rumors about their people posting on Twitter, X, whatever, and on the message board about the amount of money he was getting, and we've seen, I've seen four to 500000 I've seen the 600000 range, and then we also saw that maybe Indiana offered him even more but he took less to kind of stay home. Is that kind of the right ballpark we're talking here? And are those rumors kind of? Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't give you the exact number, but the, you know, that, that ballpark is, you know, uh, very relevant. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're really happy to have his, you know, his team coach Dobbins, his mom, they're, they're delightful people. They wanted to be here. And, you know, again, we had to make it work for him. And, you know, I think it's going to be a great, uh, in a great partnership between the two of us. I mean, that's sort of how, how you have to look at everything now. And the way you just said that, like, if a player wants to come, you're going to be able to find the money to get them. So does it, there is a pool of money that's just kind of collected for Turtle NIL, right? But then also you do these independent sort of searches for money for each specific player as well. Is that, or how is that whole thing managed? Yeah, so, you know, within Turtle NIL is also Turtle Athletic Foundation, which is the 501c3 arm. And that's primarily for the high net worth donors that want to get tax deductions. So um, that's, you know, a good portion of the money we raise is through that. And we uh, compensate the players to do charitable works. And um, the players really like it. It's great for the community. And, you know, it enables us to raise a lot, pretty much every collective in the country does it this way. Um, you know, we, we try to pay the players, you know, fair market value for their time to go uh, do these charitable events. And um, it's worked really well. We, um, you know, with Turtle and IL, that's kind of the holding company of the whole thing, but it's separate from, from the Turtle Athletic Foundation. But I don't want to confuse everyone with it. But the uh, Turtle and IL is more um, for the, you know, appearances, marketing deals, signing basketballs, going to Lido's, you know, for an appearance or Cornerstone or one of those type things. So yeah, I saw um, you guys in the parking lot at one of the football games too. I think you yeah, know, yeah, we kind of did that as a you know a appreciation thing since you know yeah. we had hundreds of donors to the Turtle and IL, so we figured. Let's get the guys out there and sign autographs for the kids and take pictures and stuff. And it it, it was really well. And, you know, really, uh, to a man, we've never had a problem with any player in three years showing up to something. They've been excellent. Harry, what's the um, fundraising process like? What's the? Can you give us an idea of the breakdown in terms of how much of the NIL budget is um, a heavy hitter giving six figures as opposed to, like, corporate – sponsorships and that sort of thing. And then also fans who just, you know, chip in here and there. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, this is sort of how we do it. And pretty much every, everyone, again, around the country is the same way. You, you kind of have four buckets. And, you know, the first is the super high net worth uh, guys, the guys that will write seven and eight figure checks without thinking about it every year. Me and Larry. You're talking about me and Larry, right? Larry's going to do it. Um, yeah. In fact, Larry, I'm going to send you the banking information tomorrow. Um, cool. uh, we don't really have, we're not strong on that end where, you know, a lot of the, the bigger schools will have, you know, two or three guys stroking $3 million a year checks just, you know, because they want a good basketball team. 
uh, you know, the next bucket is like the what I call the five to six figure guys, the, you know, 10,000 to 100,000 donations. And we're pretty strong there. We have hundreds of people willing to do that. And that is the absolute bulk of our, um, you know, collections and fundraising. And then, you know, the third bucket is the club members. And, you know, Alex uh, O'Neill, who, you know, helps me run the, the collective and I, Put our club together like overnight and we just i mean it our website's good and you know I, i'm proud of it but we you know we didn't have a lot of money to put into it so we kind of slapped it together and we you know we have a few hundred donors and we appreciate everyone who's in there but you look at someone you know like a, a school in florida who's in the sec and they have thirteen thousand seven hundred people paying a thousand dollars you know a year into that donation so um, I would say we're pretty weak on the small donors right now. Part of it, our fault and part of it just endemic to the giving of Maryland. And mm. uh, I'll talk more about the new collective, uh, the one Maryland collective. I think we're going to, we're going to juice up the club and do better at that. And then, you know, the last, you know, bucket is, you know, the, uh, the marketing deals, the national deals, the Pepsis, the, you know, Jimmy John's, things like that. And we're, um, Actually, the athletic department has been very helpful in trying to make introductions with us to uh, get some of those national deals. And, and um, you know, particularly I want to shout out to Brian Ullman, who's been, you know, he's the head of marketing at Maryland. He's been really helpful and he's a big fan of the basketball and he wants to help football and basketball become better. So, it, you know, those are really how the fundraising works. And I think just specifically for basketball next year, I feel good going into the upcoming year that we're going to have enough money to field a great team. And you mentioned to follow up on that, that, you know, the big chunk is that kind of second level, you know, significant, but not massive donor. Like not to, I don't want to get into the whole existential crisis of college sports and NIL and all that stuff, but any concern about like donor fatigue for those people after two or three years, you know, you're not getting a building named after yourself or season tickets out of it. So it's all got to just continually be, just for the good of getting good players. Yeah, we're um, uh, terrified of that happening, as is everyone else in the country. But um, and you know, uh, you know, again, we're gonna we're moving more towards marketing, you know, more national marketing deals and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, at at some point, whether it's the NCAA or Congress, someone's got to step in and start putting some guardrails on this. It's ridiculous what's going on, but. Uh, to answer your original question, we, the, um, uh, the the donor uh, base for this year, that sort of, you know, um, the, the, six, the five and six figure people is very strong. People are, um, you know, no one's, you know, no one's happy with last season and everyone's willing to support Kevin Willard and, and the coaches to make a better season. So we've had record fundraising for this year. When... When people are donating, I, I, I've thought about this a little bit. Maryland is going to be making something like $80 million a year from the Big Ten through the television contract and now through the new college football playoff, the payouts that each school is going to get, something 80-plus million, crazy. When they were in the ACC, it was something like $17 million a year, something like that. They're, they've quadrupled it in the last 10 to 12 years. The athletic department, and they're almost paid off, right, all the debts that they owe from the, from the conference switch. Athletic department should be like flush with money and and supporting itself in a big way. Do you do 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 people need to donate to the Terrapin Club anymore? Can all that money that normally goes to Terrapin Club can that be say, hey, don't donate there, donate to the NIL? So right? I mean, that, that's a decision that you know Damon would make, but you know you're seeing uh, you know they hired Kirby Mills, who's you know w one of us from a. Uh, uh, Arizona State, and he he's done a good good job of shifting the narrative a little bit. He's been very open to um, that exact scenario. But you know, the athletic department ha has to be careful about what they can and cannot do with the money from not only an NCAA level but from a you know state governance level. So it's uh, I would like to see them fund this whole thing, but it's really not my decision right now. But yes, Larry, I think that's you know the direction it should be going to. Yeah. Last year, Harry, when we had you on, you um, 
recounted a story of meeting with Jameer Smith's mother, or excuse me, Jameer Smith, Jameer Young's mother, um, as the portal was opening up and as the process was developing, he was really con considering, and you spoke with him about, you spoke with the mother about leaving his legacy and things like that and how that's worth maybe more than a few extra bucks. Um, what do you think about this way this season had gone? And can you imagine what it would have been if, if that if that conversation didn't take place or if even if that wasn't what pushed him over the edge, if Jameer wasn't back, just the all-around uh, kind of deflating year? Oh, man, I'm, you're saying this, I'm getting chills. I mean, what a, what a godsend Jameer Young was. I mean, we, besides being a superstar player, he's just such a nice young man, and he's going to be super successful in everything he does. His mom is great, too. We're, we're very close. We talk all the time. And uh, I'm just thankful he decided to come here. I mean, I, it was never a question in my mind, you know, that he was going to reach the level he, he did as far as a player. Uh, I feel bad for him because when we uh, met that time, he went over some goals he had for this year. And they, they weren't, you know, me being first team All-American or me, you know, me being first team Big Ten. It was, yeah. I want to win the Big Ten championship. You know, I want to go deep into the NCAAs. I want to win three games in the tournament. So I, I feel bad for Jameer that we, we couldn't accomplish that. But he did everything, you know, he could do to get us there. And, you know, we're blessed to have him. A while ago, a couple of questions ago, you said something about how you feel like you've got a good war chest to go after some pieces for next year. Uh, and one of the big issues is that here comes Derek Queen. And he's getting a lot of money that we just talked about. And then you have a player like Julian Reese, who, again, we don't know the numbers, who might not be making the same amount of money. Is that is that something that causes issues? It's like there's been rumors that maybe Julian might leave to get more money, or maybe Maryland has to now compensate Julian in the same way they're compensating Dare Queen to ease some of that and maybe give him more even. I mean, he's a proven player at Maryland, right? So, like, how is all of that working? Do you guys have any hand in that? Or is that all, you know, you you give the money and then the coaches handle all the other dynamics? No, I mean, we have a say in it, and, you know, you're you're spot on with, with Julian. But, you know, Julian's a proven player. Uh, we, you know, we want him back. The coaches want him back. You know, he – deserves to make more than even a five-star freshman because he's, you know, been here three years and proven yeah. himself. So, you know, we, we would come up with an offer that would reflect that. Now, having said that, you know, Julian's, you know, a, a very marketable person and there's teams out there that, you know, might want to really give him a huge amount of money to come play there. And if that's the case, then, you know, I wouldn't begrudge him for doing it. Yeah. And, you know, sort of the same thing happened last year with Hunter Dickinson. We were extremely competitive with our offer to him, but, you know, where he wound up, the offer was a lot more and can't blame a kid for that. Yeah. We'd all do the same thing, right? If we're in our professional careers, like if. Yeah. I mean, off, you know, if you're five or 10% off, that's one thing, but if you're a hundred percent off, that's another thing. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and for us, it's not going to come down to that one-year opportunity for that, you know, you're making a decision for the next 10 years. For these guys, obviously, next next year might be your best opportunity ever to, to hit it big with a big check. It's like, right, and, you know, again, uh, you know, specifically with Julian, I mean, his, you know, mom is extremely savvy about how to navigate the marketplace, and he's got good people behind him, and she has a track record with, you know, really – helping uh, Angel Jr., you know, become a superstar. So, you know, from their perspective, um, you know, it, you know, they might have to pursue his best market, you know, value. Now, having said that, we want him back. We hope he comes back and think he'll do great things here if he does. So we have so a couple guys of questions. So far have jumped in the portal. Uh, I think they'll at least, you know, probably there'll be more. How do you feel about how many, if you can say, are staying or, or going or from what you're hearing or, you know, what the level of overhaul might be this spring? I'm actually surprised Surprised so far now. Again, it's what we're four days into it or three days um, uh, that a lot of the guys are, you know, they want to stay and they're saying they're staying now. Um, I think what uh, Cal and um, Noah. Yeah. 
and Noah and, you know, uh, maybe a few other ones. But I, I think so far the ones we're seeing that are going into the portal are guys that want more playing time and can't blame them for that. I mean, they're, yeah. you know, maybe they're not Big Ten level. Maybe they're stuck behind you know, too many people to really get a shot. So, um you know, like we saw, some of us saw Marcus Dock replay, you know, in the in the uh, play-in tournament last night for Howard, you know. So he wanted more playing time. He's had a nice career there. So it might work for some people. But uh, I've been a little surprised that there hasn't been the, um, you know, mass move towards the door here. I think a lot of guys really like it here. They believe in the coach and believe in the team. And, you know, they want to come back. Until yeah. they see that guy come from the portal at their position. Yeah, I don't know. We're 100% right, but you know, we could be nice guys or we can win. We can't really do both. No, yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah. We have a few questions in the chat um, I want to hit you with. This is from David Lawrence. What unique opportunities do you feel exist in the DMV to help maximize the NL situation? Or does that not matter? Is it just money? What the most David's money? contributor of ours. And I thank you, David, for, for your contributions. I recognize the name. And, um, you know, it, it's always difficult in this area for uh, marketing opportunities because you're competing with seven or eight different pro teams. And it's a little unique versus a lot of the other Big Ten schools. So, um, you know, we're working local stuff. You know, they're small and mid-sized deals. And, you know, the um, person they hired for one Maryland collective, uh, Chris Weiner, who uh, is a Terp, and you know, is happy to be here. He came from the nationals and he worked national deals. So he's, you know, he's gonna be pushing it hard. That's his mandate right now is to, you know, get deals so all the sports can share in them. Yeah, how does this can you give uh sorry, Harry or Larry, can you can you give like a kind of um explain to me like I'm five kind of explanation about how the one Maryland collective and what it's all going to cover and how that will affect basketball fundraising so we um you know the athletic department uh formed they decided they really wanted to have all the collectives under one umbrella so they formed the one maryland collective and they hired a professional management company blueprint sports to run it which i um think both of those moves were the right things and particularly because some of the uh, a lot of the other sports were having trouble getting off the ground like we we got off the ground really quickly and you know there's there's enough core basketball guys that you know we could raise half a million dollars a million dollars pretty much in the first week just to get it started uh when mark turgeon asked us to 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 do it two years ago um but a lot of the other uh, sports were having trouble so they sort of formed a one maryland collective to uh oversee it all and you know, they came to us and we said, well, you know, we, you know, we fly the turf flag and we're happy to join in, but you know, you don't really, we don't really need your help right now. We're running it fine. So let us just kind of keep it on the side until you get your, your feet, you know, on the ground with football and lacrosse and, and women's basketball and all the other and soccer and all the other ones. So that's sort of the plan where we're going to eventually merge in turtle NIL uh, and turtle athletic foundation to the one Maryland collective. So um, they, you know, are what we have mandated to them is that uh, if someone donates to the one Maryland collective and says it goes to men's basketball, then we get a hundred percent of that. And they agree to that. So there's really going to be no uh, difference from a fundraising perspective. It's just going to be more professional management because when you look at it, I mean, I'm, you know, happy to be doing this and I'm, you know, Kevin Willard calls me the de facto general manager, but, you know, I'm retired and I'm not paid and, you know, I want to go play golf in the days and I live in Florida and, you know, they, they have a need, labor of love, right? You know, they need full time and attention now. I mean, I, I've been, you know, lucky with uh, Alex and Neil and, you know, Harvey and Stan helping all, all of us out. You know, we managed to get it done and it's fairly easy with basketball because you're only managing, you know, 10 or 12 players. But um, you look at football where you got 60 or 70 guys you got to take care of. That's an overwhelming task. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna act now that you said that. I'm gonna have them call you and see if you'll help them with that. Yeah, <laughs> I get calls from a lot of people. Yeah, we got a couple of sort of 
financial type questions in, in the chat as well from Dan Hartle. He's asking, what is the tax situation for qualified charitable distributions from IRAs? Uh, Dan, I also appreciate your donations in the past. I, I do not have that answer. Uh, I don't know, but I will find it out and email you. I have your email. Um, and then another one from Tim Wynn. Do players pay tax on the NIL income? I would assume so. Uh, same time you do, Tim. You know, it's coming down the pipe. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, um, I mean. <laughs> we have, uh, you know, she's uh, a huge fan. And on the uh, the Board of Trustees, Laura Sheeler handles our, uh, she's a, a forensic uh, tax accountant. She handles our uh, accounting. Uh, f to keep it at arm's length, we, you know, outsource it to a firm to do uh, the taxes. And we send everyone 1099s and all the parents have gotten back to me this year. We follow up with them to make sure everything's only up and up. And then, you know, as far as I know, everyone's filing their taxes. And then one more, let's go. Ethan Podbureski here. If I want to support the basketball team, should I donate to one Maryland and designate to basketball or turtle NIL? You should, uh, you know, just start migrating over one Maryland and designate to basketball and, I can guarantee you 100% of what you give, Ethan, will come to us. Very good, very good. Hey, we end every interview by playing fill in the blank. I'm going to give you five rapid fire questions to say the first thing that comes to your mind, all right? <laughs> Wait, let me drink. You got it. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> the most NIL a player has ever asked for is? A uh, million dollars. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> I get. I can guess who that is. All right, the non-revenue sport that has started getting traction in the NI world is women's soccer. Really? Okay. All right. The Mount Rushmore of Maryland basketball is wow. Gary Williams, Juan Dixon, Lefty Drizel, and Jameer Young. What? No, lady. <laughs> Not, Lenny, that's sacrilege. You can't, you cannot leave Lenny out. Oh my God. All right. Lenny, Vegas. No, Jameer's my guy. I got to put Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. The farthest Maryland will go in the NCAA tournament under Kevin Willard will be? Uh, at least the final four. All right. Last one. Next year's starting lineup for Maryland basketball will be? <laughs> uh, Julian Reese. Somebody. <laughs> Day Chong, <laughs> somebody, somebody. <laughs> you got to read you have, read the site, and you'll find out who it might you be. Have a, you have a good idea who the somebodies are, right? Uh, we have cast a wide net, and we're we're going to get our share of good guys. But you know, it, it's funny right now. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, the, the big schools had all the money and then, you know, the, the Maryland's and the, you know, our level had good money. Now, you know, Bryant has money and, you know, uh, Quinnipiac has money. So everyone has money to give players. So it's become a lot more competitive. Well, in a way, I kind of like that. I'd, I'd rather yeah. it be that than Kansas and Duke and Kentucky getting every player. That's what well, they're still doing that. But well, I mean, anyway, you know, yeah. Kansas didn't have a great year. They they spent you know Villanova or St. John's. Look at the money those guys spent, and um, you know, you, you got to yeah. be careful. You can throw money and still not have it work. Yeah, the the basketball teams team needs the college basketball version of Mike Elias is what they need. The guy with the lowest payroll in baseball winning the most games in the American League. That's what they need. Yes. No pressure, Harry. No pressure. Well, <laughs> if one of your uh, subscribers can come up with the proper metric for us to use, the wins above replacement. Yeah. yeah a lot of smart people. Well, there is there is that. Yeah. Bart Torvik and Ken Palmer are the two most prominent examples of that kind of thing. But, yeah, that's all over the place. So. Yeah, but does it translate into to winning? Yeah. To dollars, yeah. Wins. How many? How many wins is? Or how many dollars per win? Like people, you know, are you? You're looking to pay anyway. All right. All right. Quickly to you, Larry. Who's going to win the uh, win the NCAA tournament? I did. Uh, I did a pool for work, and I tried to be like slightly off the radar because I didn't want to be one of the people picking. You know, 
Purdue and Houston and UConn. So I picked Iowa State just because I felt like they were, you know, just off the radar enough that not many people. So if they did win, I'd have a very good chance to win the bracket. That's what I. Yeah. Think. How about you, Jeff? I hate I hate picking chalk. Like I despise picking chalk. So I'm sure I'll switch this tonight when I finally have it. Enter it in, but it's hard not to pick UConn. You know, they're yeah. well experienced, loaded, maybe the best point guard in the country. He's a big yeah. man. He's got it. Hurley's got it rolling. He does. He's on a roll. All right, Harry, thank you so much. This is uh, every time you're on, it's so informative and very cool and it gets everybody kind of excited. And the, the, you have good news for us this year that the NIL program has bumped it up feels really good that they're going to have the money to get the players they need. And, you know, maybe they can do a one-year turnaround oh. here. Maybe Harry, can before do you jump off, you want to tell everybody how to donate or become a member? Uh, you know, you can donate oh, yeah. to the One Maryland Collective. Je Jeff will post the, the link to it. And uh, uh, yeah, every donation, big or small, is appreciated. And, you know, I'd like to get, um, you know, Jeff's subscribers. You know, how many do you have now? A couple thousand? A few, yeah, a few thousand. I, I like to, you know, get our hundred number up, you know, to five hundred. That would be great. You should. I mean, we got we have over four thousand subscribers. At least half you guys can ship. I mean, some people, I guess, are just some people are just opposed to the concept. It seems like in general, but otherwise, um, you know, there's no reason why you can't. They they have member. Do they have memberships for one Maryland like you guys did at oh, different yeah. Yeah, price points? Have, have that. So you can yeah. go big or small. Yeah. It'll just be easier because we're going to eventually migrate to there. So I might, as well, you know, might as well just go to that direction. But, you know, again, to to reiterate, every dollar goes to, you know, that you put in to say you want to go to Maryland men's basketball, goes to Maryland men's basketball. All right, Harry. Thank you so much for joining us. And you as well, guys. This is always great. Thanks, yeah, Harry. maybe we'll make it an annual portal season thing. We, we bring Harry on so we can. Talk shop. Certainly, guys. Be All good. Right. Take Thanks, care. Harry. All right. Yep. Bye. Good stuff. All right. There he was. He's, he's pretty he's very forthcoming with it, you know, considering more so than you than you would think. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I figured he wasn't going to give names when I did the film. I always try to do that, like with the last one. Like who's going to commit? Sometimes players do it. They they say who's going to come with them, but Everybody, they're like, yeah. Willard, Willard might not like it if he's out here like giving out spoilers. Yeah, right. But you're gonna get that info on the site anyway, so it's all good. Yeah, I think we've had like five articles in the past two days. There's a lot. There's a lot shaking right now. They have a chance at some pretty good players. Obviously, you know. It's hard to tell sometimes between the guys who, who kind of already know they want to come, so they come visit and commit, and then these guys like Dickinson who drag it out for what seemed like an eternity. But it just opened on Monday, and they've got some pretty good things cooking so far, potentially. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly feel more excited about it. I feel like he said Maryland's in the top 10, did he say, of NIO, or did he say 10%? I, he said top I don't know, 10. but, you know – they're definitely like roughly, I think, three times the budget of last year from what I've heard. Okay. Well, that means three times as many wins. They had 15 this year. They should go 45 and 5 and 0. Now. There you go. Yeah, that's a lot. Yes. There we go. All right. Three times the money, three times the wins. All right. Hey, we got a lot of people watching right now. That was a cool segment. We have all kinds of guests like this all the time on here. Very informative, very cool guests. People connected to the program, great players, great coaches. Do us a favor, subscribe so you'll know when we have those guests on here. Hit the subscribe button, hit like, all that stuff for us. On Thank YouTube. you very much. Yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, we have, we have, I can see all the different platforms. We have actually more people on uh, X right now than YouTube. <laughs> yeah but that's okay it's cool and, oh and facebook too facebook too is doing well anyway it's good hey everybody we love everybody um so i don't know how much do you want to get into names because we were taught we were starting to get um, into that when harry joined or do you want to leave that for the articles on the board 
Um, I mean, it's not a secret that they're involved with Jacoby Gillespie, a point guard from Belmont. Really good numbers last year. Does it all. Plays defense. He was all defense um, in the Missouri Valley. Averaged like 17 a game. He's, I mean, he's one of the top guys in the portal right now, at least. So they're involved with him. He'll be on campus soon. Obviously, as I've been reporting for about a month and a half, they have a good chance with Rodney Rice former Virginia Tech guard and the Matha star, really good player, very offensively gifted. Obviously, that's what they need, given the lack of basically a single proven perimeter score on the entire roster right now, right? So you need lots of guards. And then there's a whole bunch of other names popping up and other things happening. And uh, I'll actually have more on Thursday uh, about some more guys that they're interested in. Okay, and I had I had a Maryland rank them where I had a bunch of guys listed. I'm not going to give you that now because that's I wanted to see how much you wanted to get into that. But <laughs> season's over, portal season, and here we are. It's also football recruiting season, and football's off to a pretty good start, aren't they? Yeah, I mean they're they're recruiting at a higher level before than before. You know, four star. Uh, linebacker from a week ago for the pole kid from Virginia, the higher level, you know, had uh, Alabama, tons of other good offers. So uh, obviously the kid they pulled late in the cycle last from Kevin Humes from St. Francis was, a, was another four star. So it feels like all the momentum that they've been slowly building during the past few years is, is uh, coagulating right now. And, you know, is helping them recruit at a higher level. I think their NIL situation has improved also. Maybe we can get somebody on here to talk about that too. That that would be good actually. Um, so I yeah. Just but just thinking is, that, like, is it because they've got better NIL now as well? Or they, that's, I think that's some of it, but I, I don't think that's the main thing. I think Locks just has things like solidified a little more. They, you know, you, obviously Auburn wasn't a great team, but still you waxed an SEC team like that on, national TV in your bowl game, things like that add up. Uh, and then they've yep. done some smart things with social media marketing to re to get some of the local guys, local star athletes to recruits to, uh, you know, kind of look at Maryland as a cool, the, the same challenge as always make Maryland football, a cool place to go and turn down the bigger name. So they, they feel pretty confident. They'll be able to do that a lot more this year than they have in recent years. But, this is kind of a slow period in football recruiting every year. It's, it's June. As soon as June starts, you start seeing the visits and commitments flying. So we still got a little, a little ways, which works perfect actually for our purposes. Cause once the basketball uh, portal slows down, we'll start seeing a lot more football recruiting action. We did get one more basketball question. I was, was going to move on, but he's asking who will be replacing Mike Jones and will there be any, any other coaching moves? Well, I think there's a strong favorite for the job uh, to replace Mike Jones. I've reported that a few times uh, on the site. There's no hire yet. I would think it would come pretty soon. Um, in terms of the rest of the staff, it's to be determined. You know, both guys, Greg Manning Jr. and David Cox, both of their alma maters, the head coaching jobs have opened up at both those places, and they're on the list. So, uh, you know, there's a chance it's really amazing <laughs> Just a lot of it is coincidence, but it's amazing uh, how many guys Willard has going. I mean, how many guys did Gary have get head coaching jobs in all those years? And Willard, you know, if he has another one go this year, I think that's five in two years, which is really amazing. But uh, still kind of still up in the air on those two. You know, I don't think we'll know. Well, you never know with coaching searches. Sometimes it just pops out of the blue, you know. William and Mary hired David Cox, whatever, but you know, both are definitely worth keeping tabs on. Okay. And earlier in the chat, very early on, I forget who was asked if we ever cover Maryland baseball. We, we do. I, I give a minute to the non revs every episode. Unfortunately, I was unable to uh, hook up with wheels prior to this episode and so I don't have a non-res report for you, but I do know that the baseball team is doing very well. I think the last time I saw they were 15 and five. 
They just beat JMU, who was a very highly ranked team. And they're one of the top teams in the Big Ten this year, maybe number two right now. So they're on slate to have a good season and look like a decent shot to get into postseason and into the uh, baseball tournament. And then the men's lacrosse team started off pretty well, but has struggled the last yeah. three weeks. Two, two losses. And the only win was a home game against Brown, who's not very good. And they had to go to overtime at home to do that. So um, maybe they're the not back after team, all. Yeah. The lacrosse team, you expect them to get better through the year. It looks like they've done the opposite of, the, of that a little bit. The other teams I can't tell you much about. I think the women's lacrosse team is doing very well, something like seven and one, eight and one, maybe. And they're in the top five or 10 in the country. Others I can't tell you about. That's Wheels area. We'll we'll get next show. We'll have him doing a report again. Okay. Yeah, he does an amazing job with lacrosse. If you want amazing. to follow that, so also though, it's a good idea. Once these uh, portal seasons are done, we could definitely do some stuff on here about baseball. Yeah, um, Maryland baseball sixteen and five now. By the way, I just looked at That's that. That's crazy. I think how that... many games they play in baseball? It feels like the season started forty, like, 40 some like a week ago. And they're 16 and five. Well, they generally will play probably about four games a week. They play yeah. a weekend series where they do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And they'll always have one midweek game. Yeah. So it's usually four. Um, so, yeah. So it adds up pretty quick. Really right? quick. Yeah. Uh, I do have – I have Maryland rank them. And I had six of these because I prepared for you and Paul. I'm not going to ask you the one about the transfers because I, I don't want to say the names. But do you want all five of them? Sure. Um, okay, I'll give you all five. This is or you, or you can take them. Why don't you take Paul's? We'll alternate. Take I'll take Paul's. Okay. All right. So I had you, and then the next one was for Paul, which was rank the football road game trips in order of most likely to attend, and in chronological order, they are Virginia, Indiana, Minnesota, Oregon, and Penn State. And I would say Oregon's number one. That's we're already planning on that. That's going to be a lot of fun. I feel like I'm torn about Penn State, but I, I don't know. I, I'm going to say Virginia. I live kind of actually kind of close to them, and I live out by Dulles Airport in Northern Virginia, so it's not that bad for me to get to it. So that's going to be my number two. Then I think Penn State because you can actually drive to it, even though I don't know. Penn State, that might be a little weird. And then between Indiana and Minnesota, I've been to Indiana many times because my kid went there for a semester. So, eh. And it's hard to get to. You fly to Indianapolis, and then you've got an hour drive in a cab or an Uber. Yeah. It's brutal. So I'm going to say Minnesota four and, that, and then Indiana five. All right, Jeff, for you, rank these four-star football warm targets. 24-7 has them listed as warm. Four guys listed as warm, four stars, in order of most likely to commit. In alphabetical order, Fahim Delane, Tariq Heyer, Bryce Jenkins, Malik Washington. That's you a good ready? list. Yeah. I feel like they have all a shot at all those guys, maybe a little less so with one of them. Uh, I'll go Washington first. I still feel like they're in a good place with him. He's been their top priority the whole time. Tariq, Tariq Heyer, I think, would be second probably you know what no i put bryce jakin second he goes to friendship collegiate academy where azar abdul rahim was the head coach and founder of the program his assistant's still there running the show he's got a lot of connections so i think they have a good chance with jenkins who's a one of the top defensive tackles in the area uh after that Tariq hayer i think they're in there with him but he was pretty close to committing to wisconsin a few months ago and uh, Fahim Delane from Good Counsel, who's the number one safety in the country, they're back in it. I mean, he had listed, um, I think, a top five or four, whatever it was, without Maryland. Abdul Rahim came back, worked on it, got them back in the mix. And it, it, it seems like he's at least, you know, when you consider he's a five star, number one safety in the country, he's given them uh, at least some level of, of consideration. Okay. How about just all four, like now? And they'll jump into like the top 15. <laughs> I mean, they could, get, they could definitely get two of those. I think two would be a good, you know, optimistic but realistic hope. Yeah. Three, you get three, you know, obviously. But 
I think that they will do better in the area this year. I think they, they have more momentum going. Last year was a pretty down year for them locally. Uh, but It was not good last year. No. Nothing. All right. The next one was for Paul. It was ranked these spring sports in order of most interest. Lacrosse, baseball, spring football, and the women in the tournament. So um, I was – yeah, go ahead. Just in terms of general fan interest? Uh, you could do it that way or for yourself personally. Oh, um, for me, oh, man. So you had lax, baseball, women's basketball, and what am I forgetting? Spring football. Spring football, okay. Um, for me, see, I had to look at things differently, more of a like how much content can I produce out of that? So spring football <laughs> is more – and it's more – and, you know, where, like many people, I pay closer attention to basketball and football. So naturally, if yeah. men's basketball is not in the tournament, I'm going to be paying pretty close attention to spring ball, which starts next week. Um, and then I'll go after that, um, the women in the tournament, because I'm a basketball junkie, baseball, and then lacrosse. Just a, I think I could watch a thousand lacrosse games and it still would not translate to me. I just not... Um, it's just it's never captured my attention. I went to my son, my nephew's game last weekend out in Northern Virginia. And I still can't figure out the damn rules of like, <laughs> like when you can hit, how you can hit somebody, how hard. I saw there's one hit where a guy's head almost fell off and there was nothing. And it was like a football, you know, collision. And then there was like some little rinky dink stuff. Anyways, long story, story short, I'm just not a lax guy. Well, imagine like in football on a crack back block, you can't do that. You can't block someone from behind. You can't block someone at his knee, right? There's certain, so it's like that, right? Yeah, I just can't figure out what the delineation is between what's legal yeah. and what's not specifically. Um, you know, I, don't, I think it's just because they didn't have it. We didn't, no one played lacrosse when I was a kid. It didn't get popular until years a few years after later, and then I worked. I remember I was like 18 years old. I'd work at this baseball camp every summer at Gettysburg College, and there was always a lacrosse camp at the same time. And the kids and the counselors just seemed like the biggest douchebags I've ever seen in any sort of setting like that. So that <laughs> that kind of soured um, me on it. I'm out of that conversation. I, I grew up in Baltimore, and, and even when I was a kid in the 80s, it was starting to. Yeah, well, Baltimore is an epicenter. Hotbed, yeah. Hotbed. All right. Next one. I got a couple of off topics here. This one. Uh, rank these types of vacations. Beach, big city, cruise, or something remote and far away from everything. That's a really good one. I like that. Um, beach, cruise. Big city or big something city. remote, far away from everything. Um. So I'm a beach guy, you know, like most people who grew up in the area where we grew up going out to Bethany Beach and stuff like that all the time, Ocean City, whatever. So probably the beach first, cruise second, because it's just different. You don't do it that often. You can go to like a big city anytime. City is probably last because you, you've been to most of the ones you really want to go to, although not if you're traveling internationally, but, you know, New York's always cool, but uh, it's not new. And... So in that third spot, I would have, you know, somewhere off the grid. I do. I really like that. I would, my wife, me and my wife always have the imaginary conversation of what would be cooler to have like a cabin in the woods or a beach house. And I can never really decide. Yeah. How about a beach house where that's away from everybody else? You have to find water that's not very well developed. So, yeah, but you got to have right. stuff to do in town. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The last one. This is this is a funny one. This was for Paul because I, I knew he would do something humorous with the answer, but I'll let you do it. Okay. Rank these IMS radio hosts in <laughs> order of potential success with the ladies in alphabetical order. Paul Douglas, Jeff Ehrman, Larry France, and I included Tony Wheeler, who is a Sometimes he, we do some shows and then he also has the number segment. So Paul, Jeff, Larry, and Wheels. I mean, Wheels has got to be first. Have you ever seen the look on a woman's face when you start spitting those field hockey statistics and stuff? It's like, 
you know, un un good. undefeated. Uh, I don't know. I think we're all a bunch of old guys. Yeah. Whatever game we had has probably deteriorated, you know. Um, but, yeah, I'm definitely going to say me first. You can be second after Tony. And Paul, obviously, is a distant last. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Paul's always last in these things. Yeah. Always last. Always last. And he's he crapped out on us on today. So, you know, he gets get. to be last. He gets to be last. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We had and have still a huge crowd. Oh, <laughs> Tom. All right. Tom, Tom wins. You forgot none of the <laughs> none above. Of, for that sure. basically is a summary of my answer. Yeah, <laughs> none of the above. Our good buddy, Tom. Yeah, Tom's a good guy. Okay, we do still have a ton of you guys. Please, if you have, I know I asked before, but please, if you have not subscribed, please do that. Please do that. Um, still trying to build the numbers and all that. It helps us greatly, and it helps you know when we're going to have a show and and which guests we're going to have and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it helps everybody, and it's free. It's free for everybody. So all you got to do is click one button or two if you want to do the bell and get the alerts, but you don't have to do that. Harry Geller, awesome guest, man. He's it's so much insight. Everybody has it, NIL seems like this weird kind of vague, mysterious, mysterious world, and he he sheds a lot of light on it for us. So that's really cool. And he dropped some cool info. And I think, I think everybody after listening to that's going to feel a lot more positive about the program right now, and about where they're headed in the next season. I do after hearing his responses and the things he said. So, yeah, I, I feel like, hey, maybe they are going to be able to field a, a tournament caliber team or even better maybe. Um, so Yeah, they've upgraded. Yeah, that's very, very good news. All right, thank you guys, everybody. Thank you guys very much. Uh, I don't know. We're kind of in the off season now, so I don't know if we're going to be going every week. We will make it widely known. We'll post it on the message board. We'll post it on Twitter and Facebook and, and all the other spots. Uh, we will see you guys next time. This is IMS Radio.